we got two sets of slides that we need to cover today, although there's not a lot. I think there's about maybe 70, 70 ish. Um, the anatomy is what's going to take up most of most of the time. Um, so there's there's a lot of parts to it. So again, although there's not a lot of slides to it, there are a lot of uh, um, detail and, and structure that comes along with the skull. Um, again, the assumption is you guys have already had the anatomy and physiology, so I try to go quickly, but not without you guys losing the, the quality of the material. So if there's anything that you guys need me to stop and slow down on, please let me know. Okay. So the first part we'll talk about the anatomy, the second part we'll talk about the positions. There's a lot of positions, but we're only going to focus on a few today that you will need to um, help you in our laboratory assignments. Okay, so we break it, we, we, we're going to break this up. Um, okay, so the skull. The skull is the bony skeleton of the head. It includes eight cranial bones and then 14 cranial bones. So just the skull alone, what is that, uh, 20, 22 bones? 14 facial bones. What's it, what's it, what's 14? 22, 22 bones, okay, so 22 bones. Okay, and then we're not talking about the pairs. So there's uh, many bones in the face and the skull that do um, end up in pairs. So we're talking about 14, uh, 22 plus bones. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do the skull today. Um, so the, we have eight cranial bones. The eight cranial bones includes one frontal, two parietals, what else, one occipital. You guys remember all this? Mm -hmm. uh, two temporal. Okay, so we got uh, two temporals, also paratemporals, one sphenoid bone and one ethmoid bone. Mm -hmm. Did I say everything? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the skull again is just a general term of the head. Um, now if we broke them, break them down into two different sides. The first one here is the bony calvaria. This is the skull cap. So the skull cap is composed of the frontals, uh, you got the frontals, one frontal, I'm sorry, uh, two parietals, uh, an occipital, and then the uh, sphenoid bone. Okay? So that's the skull cap. And then the floor of the cranium is made up of both temporals, the sphenoid bone, and then the ethmoid bone. So here we have the lateral aspect of the skull, and here is, uh, you, in looking at the floor of the, the skull, you really can't see it in these type of projections. You would actually have to do a more of a sagittal view of or what you call an SM view to visualize the other bones. Because the bone itself is three-dimensional, very difficult to identify either of those, each of those structures um, radiographically. Now, we're only gonna span, I think, what, how many weeks are we spending on this? Is it, is it three weeks? Three weeks with the facial bones? Um, I think it's El Camino College that spends an entire semester, you know, one semester on just the skull. So we're only gonna do this in three weeks, okay? Why, why is that though? Why only three weeks? You're only, only focusing on what we Okay, need. only focusing on what we need and most of the studies are done now where? CT. CT, okay. Um, However, you still may get a, a lot of the skull, uh, skull work when the patient is going, uh, going through the emergency room, okay? Uh, you'll have patients coming in on an outpatient basis where you do need to do the skull works too. And it's all about that insurance scheme. So if the insurance can't pay for it, we have to do it radiographically through overheads like this, okay? All right, different slide. Okay, I think this, well, I just put the picture here from the book because the one that you have, I don't think was very detailed. It didn't, it didn't tell you where all the different parts were. It was just a blank picture, right, without any, mm -hmm. right. any pointers, okay. So the frontal bone, okay, your forehead, forms the, uh, first it forms two parts. You have your forehead, uh, which is the squamous or vertical portion. When we talk about squamous or squamish portion, we have squamish portions in, in uh, a majority of the cranium. And what all uh, squamous or squamish means is just the flat portion. That's all it means, it's the flat portion of that bone, okay? So the forehead is the squamous 
vertical portion and then the superior part or the orbital portion is also known as the horizontal portion. These are all different types of bony landmarks. First is the glabella. The glabella is the area between your eyes and where the bridge of your nose ends. Okay, so that's the glabella. This, what I'm gonna be talking about here are in very important bony landmarks when positioning for skull studies. Next one here is the superciliary ridge. Superciliary ridge is just that little ridge above your eyebrows. Okay, you can feel that bony protrusion. That's your superciliary ridge. Right below that is a ridge. Okay, right below your eyebrows is that ridge. This is known as the supraorbital margin. So it's right underneath your eyebrows. Okay, and that is the edge of your upper part of your orbit. Okay. Now above that, if we go, so we go, we've got the, the margin superciliary and then right above your eyebrows now is the groove. So if you take your fingers, you can feel an indentation, okay, right before it touches your, your eyebrows, right? You guys feel that little groove? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a superorbital groove. And then the frontal tuberosity of eminence is that pointy part of your head. You can just put your hand on there and you can feel a, a, a bump right in the front of your head. You guys feel that? Okay, so that's the tuberosity or the eminence. All right, the four bones that articul articulates with the frontal bone includes both parietal, sphenoid, and the ethmoid bone. Any questions so far? Well, where is the superorbital margin again? Superorbital margin is right below your, your eyebrows, so if you go underneath it, it's that ridge. It's at the edge of your orbit. Okay. Right at the edge of the orbit, right here. Yeah. Yeah, so where your eye socket is, it's that upper ridge. Okay, and now we're looking at the frontal bone uh, inferiorly. This is also something that I added. Also, there was huge typos on your slides. So, A is glabella. What do you guys have there on yours? Frontal tuberosity. Okay. So, A is the glabella. Glabella, again, is the area between your eyes. So, change A. In I forget what B was on yours, but that's Labella. The, Labella, okay. Yeah. B is the superciliary ridge or the arch. And then C is the superorbital margin. This entire section here is where the frontal tuberosity is located. Okay. Yes, no, what? Huh? C. C is the superorbital margin, SOM. <laughs> and there's an area over here for the uh, a notch, which allows, uh, this is where the uh, ethmoid bone is going to uh, sit. So there is a, a space or a gap for that ethmoid bone. Another one of the uh, skull bones, that will fit right in there, okay? Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay, uh, now we have here the parietal and the occipital bone. We have a pair of parietal bones. Um, this particular slide, okay, so it's asking which uh, bones do the parietals articulate with, so there's a total of five. So the parietal articulates with one frontal, one occipital, Okay, one frontal, one occipital. The temporals, okay. Then you have the sphenoid, which is right here. This is your sphenoid right here. And then, uh, what's the last one there? And the other parietal. Right. And then the occipital articulates with the two parietals, two temporals, and then right on the bottom is the atlow occipital joint. So the ox occipital articulates with C1. And then anteriorly, it's also going to articulate with the sphenoid bone. You guys have this slide, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so on occipital bone, there's not a lot to it. So let's just 
So the squamous portion, the back of your head, again, squamous because it's the flat part of the occipital, okay? If you rub, if you put your hands down the back of your head, you're gonna feel that bony protrusion. That is known as the inion or the occipital protuberance, the inion or the occipital protuberance. On the very bottom of the occipital is a smooth surface, and this is where C1 articulates with the base of your skull, and you have a pair of them, okay? In the inferior portion of the occipital bone, you have a huge opening, and that's called the foramen magnum. What goes through there? The spinal column. Spinal cord, okay, spinal cord. All right, any questions here? Not much with the occipital bone, right? Temporal bone. The temporal bone, again, it also has a squamous portion. There's gonna be an opening here, which is the opening into your inner ear. The outer part is known as the external auditory meatus. This, again, is one of the landmarks that we use in positioning for the skull. Down here we have the mastoid portion, the inferior part of the temporal bone. It's very porous, so you're gonna find a lot of air cells in here, okay? Mastoid air cells will be found in the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. Now back in the day, we are gonna be talking about a couple of the positions for the mastoids, but back in the day we used to do x-rays of the mastoids, plain overhead x-rays and you literally had to know your positions very well because it wasn't just a matter of just angling your tube a certain direction. You were angling and also obliquing your tube and the patient was also obliquing their head too in different directions. So instead of dealing with usually two angles, you may be dealing with two angles of your tube and two angles of your head. Okay, it, it was a, a series of three positions but we did them as uh, we did it bilaterally, and just those six radiographs alone took anywhere between two to three hours to do. Oh my God. Because nobody can get the perfect position. Doctor would say, go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. So no, and it was one of those things that we only saw it once in a blue moon. Even when we got the book, we couldn't do it right. So I took it upon myself to play with skull phantoms and figure out, um, the easiest way to try to get those positions done. And, and, and I'm upset about it because I lost all those records and I could have had a position named after me. <laughs> so whenever the mastoids came, they came up, I did it my way, the way I studied how to work with the phantoms and I was able to do it in 30 minutes, those six positions. But, it's, <coughs> but now they do a CT, so. It wouldn't have been good anyways, but it would have been nice to have my name on there. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, this is the mastoid air, uh, air cells, mastoid portion. There is a bony projection. It's a very thin bone that projects from that area. This is a styloid process. There is going to be a process of the temporal bone. This is known as the zygomatic process. And when it meets up with the zygoma, or the cheekbone of the facial bones, it forms the zygomatic arch. There is a little indentation here where the con, uh, condyle of the mandibule, uh, mandible fits, and that is your uh, temporal mandibular uh, joint, or your TMJs. So this little area here is the uh, temporal mandibular fossa. Okay, any questions here? All right. Here is an anterior view of the, the, <coughs> the temporal bone. This bone, you have this very thick bone that goes across, across the orbits, okay? Remember, we have two temporal bones, so one here, one here. So this is gonna form a bridge all the way across. It's a very thick uh, type of bone in there is where we're going to find the organs of hearing and equilibrium. It's within this area known as the petrous portion. So this is again where we're gonna find the organs of, of hearing and also equilibrium. 
This Petrus portion has various names. It's called the pyramids, the Pars Petrosa, or the Petromastoid portion, depending on which book you're reading or what the doctors are referencing, but they all mean the same thing. At the very top of this Petrus portion is a very thick edge that is seen radiographically. And we use this edge to critique our films or our images to make sure that we got proper position. So this area is known as a Petrus ridge or the Petrus apex. Again, this is very significant in, in making sure that you got proper position of your skull x-rays. And we'll, I'll give you guys a demonstration of that later on. All right, so three parts to the temporal bone. We got the squamous portion, forms the wall of the skull, mastoid portion, which contains the air cells, and then the petrous portion, and where you're going to find the organs of hearing and also equilibrium. Okay, any questions? Here is uh, infra superior view. Uh, let me see here. Petrus pyramids right in here. Again, this is where we're going to find the organs of hearing and balance. Uh, internal ac acoustic meatus is this area right here. What is that? The IAM, or the internal acoustic meatus, is the passage for nerves of hearing and also balance. Right next to the meatus, there is going to be a hole, a foramen, known as the jugular foramen, and this allows for passage of the jugular veins and also some certain uh, certain cranial nerves. Okay, so that's the passage of cranial nerves and your jugular vein. Jugular vein for what? It's a vein from coming from where? Okay, what feeds the brain? The artery. The artery. Okay, good. So then that would be the vein for drainage of blood from the, um, from the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Jugular foramen. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you guys thinking of, are you guys not with me today? Are you guys thinking about sticking each other this afternoon? Yes. Yes. Is that where your mind's at? Okay. <laughs> okay, that too. Mr. Sucks. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. All right, the sphenoid bone. Sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is the center or anchor of all the cranial bones. So it anchors all the cranial bones. This has a lot of parts to it. A lot of parts. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> So the first one here is, when you look at it, it kind of looks like a bat. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, yes? Mm -hmm. You guys ever watch any of the old Japanese movies? You guys remember Rodan? No. 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 <laughs> okay, let's forget ever that. Ever watch thing. Batman again? You guys don't remember, like it was around Godzilla. It was Rodan, you guys remember Rodan? One of a couple of you guys do? Okay. Anyways, it looks like Rodan. It was a, a monster bird. It looked like a, a mix of a vulture and a dodo bird. Okay. Anyways, if you look at it as like a bat, it has uh, two sets of wings. You have the greater wing and then you have the lesser wing. Okay, the greater wing and the lesser wing. The lesser wing is going to come anterior, anteriorly and for, uh, form a point. This point is known as the anterior clinoid process, the anterior clinoid process. Now this isn't a, a real good view to look at the sphenoid bone, so what we have to do is we've got to look at it in an, an oblique uh, position. I think it's on the uh, next slide. But we have the lesser wing, the greater wing, lesser wing. The lesser wing forms the anterior clinoid process. Right below that is a, a dip or indentation, and this is known as the cella tersica. So I'm going to go over here real quick to the lateral. I'm sorry, this is doubly. So here's the lesser. That's the uh, anterior clinoid. You have a pair of them. Okay. Then we have this little dip right here. I'm going to go to the next slide. Here's that dip. Here's your anterior clinoid process. This little dip here is what houses the pituitary gland. Okay, so here's the lesser wing, anterior clinoid process. 
you have this little area here that houses the pituitary gland that's known as the cella tersica. So this is the lateral view, cella tersica. The cella tersica is an important structural anatomy, again, that we use in, in uh, assessing proper position of skull x-rays. So we're going to look at this. Other parts of the of this area over here where the cell tricycle is, so now you have an anterior clinoid process. Right off of that now is the posterior clinoid process. So this cell tricica is formed by the anterior and posterior clinoids. Okay? Right below the posterior is what's known as the dorsum sali. What does dorsum mean? Backside. Backside. So it's just the backside of the cella. That's all it means, okay? So it's just the backside of the cella tricica. So this is dorsum cella. It's, it's a very, uh, it's a thick, thick bone. Another bone, a structural anatomy, bless you, that we use in critiquing our images. So this is the other one, the dorsum mm -hmm. sali. All right, this is significant. And then the clivus, right below the dorsum celli, there's a little indentation there, and that forms the base of support for the pons. Forms the base of support for the pons. Is this on your slides? No. No, okay. Go ahead and write that down. Mm -hmm. This one right here, the clivus, forms the base of support for the pons. This one? Yeah. That's on there? Okay. So now I'm going to back up a little bit. All right. The, the sphenoid has three holes, so three openings, three foraminas. And these allow passage for cranial nerves and also arteries. One is called the foramen rotundum which is going to be the most medial. So you'll see here that the holes go from medial, okay, then intermediate, and then most lateral. So the most medial is gonna be the foramen rotundum. Next to that will be the foramen ovale, and then the third one is the foramen spinosum. All these, again, allows for cranial nerves and arteries to pass. The clivus that we talked about on the other slide here, again, it allows, uh, this is where the, the pond sits, but it also is where you're going to find the basilar artery, another major artery that feeds the brain. Okay. Uh, as we said, the sphenoid bone does anchor all cranial bones, so it articulates with all seven cranial bones, as well as five facial bones. Okay. Are we okay with this slide here? Okay. Because. Now we're going to look at that. Okay. It looks like there's a lot, but there isn't. Okay, Because we have the greater, we have the lesser. We set the lesser points and forms the anterior clinoid process, right? Mm -hmm. Here we have the little smooth <coughs> surface, the saddle. That's why it's called the cella tersica, because it's a saddle that houses the pituitary gland right here. Okay. Now we have an opening over here. This is A. A is a superior orbital fissure where again, certain nerves and vessels pass through. B, you got that. C, optic foramen. C is the optic foramen right near, right where the, uh, the lesser wings are located. So it's an optic foramen. <coughs> what do you think is gonna go through there? Optic nerves. Optic nerves, okay. So both the optic foramen and the optic roof, this is areas of where the optic nerve and arteries pass. Okay, so actually these complement each other is C and D. Optic foramen and optic groove is where the optic nerve passes, as well as the arteries. Hard to see here right now because this looks like the, the holes are superimposed by the other bones. So because of that, 
there is a special position that we do, it's called a rhesus position, in which we are going to try to visualize that optic nerve right in the middle of the orbit. We'll talk about that next week, okay? But this can be visualized with proper positioning of the skull. Now, let's see here. Um, okay, so coming off the, the greater wings, you have projections that are going downwards. Okay, you have the medial pterygoid. Pterygoid? S sounds good to me. <laughs> pterodactyl? Yeah. No. Yes, I like that. Is it just pterodactyl? <laughs> okay. So you have your medial, you have your medial pterygoid, and then you have your lateral pterygoid. What these form is they're going to form the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Okay? Your medial pterygoid and your uh, lateral pterygoid forms the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Off, if you continue on with the pterygoid, it does cur curve up like a, a hook, and that is known as the hamilus of the pterygoid. This is the hamilus. Okay, so you have bony projection that comes straight down, but at the end, it hooks up. That's the hamilus. Okay, how are we doing? Peachy. Peachy. Isn't today pie day? Yes, it is. Okay, where's the pie? <laughs> We can have hump day and pie day at the same time. Better go get some pie. All right. Um, so the sphenoid, again, one of those bones that you can't really see radiographically. So, so you can't see them, however, through the orbits of, of the, uh, the eyes. Um, an important part of the sphenoid is right in the middle over here is the sinus. So right in the middle, let me back up here a minute. Right here in the middle, okay, where we talked about where the saddle is, okay, the cellotrisica, this main portion over here is gonna be hollow, right in the middle. So that hollow area is where you're gonna find the, uh, the, the sphenoid sinus, right here. Okay. Then we have the pterygoid, you have the medial and lateral, uh, lateral as well as the hamless that's going to form parts of the wall of the nasal, nasal cavity. So all this here, you can't see, you have to shoot right through this facial area to see those uh, pterygoid processes. Okay, ethmoid bone, ethmoid bone. Uh, let me see where should I should start. All right, let's start over here. So the ethmoid bone, three major parts. You have the crystagalli, which is the most superior part of the ethmoid bone. Then you have the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate, this flat area right here, is what's going to separate the cranial bones from the facial bones. So this separates the two areas, the cribriform plate. And then the perpendicular plate, you will see in an x-ray that goes straight down the nasal cavity. It's a very thin plate, very thin bone. And this helps form the bony nasal septum. This is the perpendicular plate right here. You're looking at it at a lateral view here, it's this wide. But when you look at it front, it's just a thin piece of bone that goes down the middle. But it's literally a plate, it extends from the front to almost the middle of your head. All right, so uh, Crystal most superior, cribriform plate. Uh, the cribriform plate, this little area right here, is, uh, <coughs> bless, you. bless you. There is uh, a lot of openings in this cribriform plate and allows for passage of your olfactory nerves. What's olfactory? Smelling. What are you going to find here? So where are you going to find your sense there? This is the sense of smelling right here, found in the cribriform plate. Uh, again, let's talk about animals. I guess it looks like a, a bat. Elephant. Everything looks like a bat. An elephant? Oh, elephant ears. Elephant yeah. ears, okay. We'll call it elephant ears with the trunk going down the middle. Okay, so the elephant ears is the lateral 
labyrinth masses, the lateral labyrinth masses. Here contains the ethmoid sinuses, so it is also hollow. It forms the medial uh, walls of the orbits and forms the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Bless you. Right below, right below the labyrinths is the middle nasal concha. Middle nasal concha. The concha looks like a shell, okay, a spiral shell. This is going to form the conscious. You have a middle, lateral, and uh, also intermediate concha. These turns or this concha warms up the air as you're breathing it. So it goes through these different conchas, 